So good afternoon um, and welcome to this um, ERCnet webinar. Um, the um, subject of today is going to be um, TTP, thrombotic um, uh, uh, thrombocytopenia and um, I'm very 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 pleased um, to introduce the speaker who um, to change gears a little bit from our usual speakers is actually not a, a nephrologist but a hematologist it's Professor Paul Coppo. Professor Paul Coppo is based in France he has an MD and a PhD in both clinical hematology and in the research field of thrombotic microangiopathies and um, he is based um, from the university standpoint at Sorbonne University and he shares his time between Saint Antoine Hospital for Clinic and the direction of the CNR MAT and the INSERM Research Institute Le Cordelier. So I'm sure he's going to give an absolutely wonderful presentation on TTP which is going to be useful for us nephrologists as it's, as it's one of the main differential diagnoses with HUS and um, something that we all wish we knew a little bit more about. So thank you so much Professor Coppo for um, having accepted our invitation and and um, welcome to ERCnet. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Marina, for your nice uh, introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm uh, really delighted to be uh, here today uh, virtually to uh, share with you uh, the exper experience of the French team in the field of uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic uh, cupura. And uh, I will uh, uh, especially uh, share with you some of uh, our recent uh, results in the field. So <laughs> here are my disclosures, uh, which uh, mostly rely on the, uh, the, the, the labs uh, involved in the development of uh, various uh, compounds uh, in the field of uh, thrombotic uh, microangiopathies which includes the anti-VWF caplacizumab for Sanofi and various uh, uh, complement uh, blockers uh, in the field of atypical uh, HOS. So to start, I would like to uh, share with you uh, this uh, uh, case. Uh, it's a true case. We uh, recently uh, had to uh, manage in uh, my center. Uh, this is the story of a 46-year-old woman who uh, was admitted to uh, our emergency room for pupera, bruises, and the transient weakness of the left uh, arm. But she told that uh, it only uh, lasts for uh, some minutes, and then this uh, weakness uh, completely uh, disappeared. She has a past history of uh, overweight and uh, autoimmune uh, thyroiditis uh, as well. She originates from West Indies and uh, at the time of clinical uh, examination in the emergency room, the neurological examination was uh, strictly unremarkable. Biologically, she had an anemia with uh, nine grams of uh, hemoglobin, a profound thrombocytopenia at 7K, uh, reticulocytes were uh, slightly increased, LDH level was increased as well, as well as was uh, unconjugated uh, bilirubin, aptoglobin was uh, decreased, serum creatinine was 150 micromol per liter or 1.57 uh, milligram per deciliter. She was not pregnant, she uh, was uh, HIV uh, negative. And in this context, uh, the diagnosis of thrombotic microangiopathy syndrome was made, and ADAMS13 activity and the antibodies against ADAMS13 were sampled. And uh, as usual, uh, these results uh, may be available within five days. So <coughs> here are the questions I have for you. So from this uh, clinical presentation, would you say the French score of this patient is consistent with uh, the diagnosis of TTP? Or that the French score of this patient is consistent instead with an, uh, the diagnosis of hemolytic remic syndrome? This patient should be uh, treated with daily plasma exchange and steroids from day one or instead this patient should receive daily plasma exchange and immunosuppression with steroids and rituximab and caplacizumab from day one. 
or would you say that caplacizumab should be started after adamcetine activity confirms TTP diagnosis? So I don't know if you want to answer uh, now. Okay, let's go. So I was told that uh, I can't see the result of the yes, poll, but uh, Marina, I think you will uh, tell me uh, what it is. Exactly. Yeah, Let's wait another 10 seconds and then. Yeah. Perfect. People are still voting. So can I close now? Okay, so um, the vote has um, been completed and 37%, um, um, so the majority, voted for the French score of this patient is consistent with a TTP, followed by 27% who voted saying that caplacizumab should be started after ADAMTS-13 activity confirms TTP. Then we have 17% who selected daily packs plus corticosteroids, rituximab plus caplacizumab from day one. And then 10% said patients should receive daily packs plus corticosteroids from day one only. And other 10%, the French score of this patient is consistent with an HUS. Okay, very interesting. <laughs> Perfect. I have this in mind, so let's uh, move on. And then I will uh, ask you again these uh, questions at the at the end of the talk to see if you change your mind according to the presentation. So first of all, uh, this is the definition of uh, TTP. TTP is a specific form of thrombotic microangiopathy, which is characterized by a profound peripheral thrombocytopenia that results from the formation of microthrombi in the vasculature of most organs, typically the brain, the heart, but also the, the kidney and the uh, adrenal glands. And this leads to uh, a picture of a multi-organ failure, which can be actually of variable severity and uh, which leads to the death of patients in the absence of adapted treatment. And uh, red blood cells will fragment on these microthrombi, generating uh, schistocytes, as you can see in the blood smear on the uh, uh, bottom right uh, side of the picture. And there is a, a specific biomarker in this uh, disease, which is a severe deficiency in the von Willebrand factor cleaving protease, ADAMS13. And according to the mechanism of this deficiency, one can distinguish the congenital form of the disease, which was formerly called upshaw schumann syndrome, before we learned that actually this patient had a, a congenital deficiency on, on, on this enzyme. This form is a, a typically an orphan disease that occurs in neonates and in the uh, pregnant uh, woman. And the other form of the disease, which is uh, much more uh, frequent, uh, at least in uh, adult practitioners, uh, is the autoimmune uh, form, which mostly involves uh, young women, typically uh, childbearing age uh, women. <laughs> the disease is spontaneously fatal in the absence of adaptive treatment. And its incidence is uh, around one to two cases per million habitants per year, which represents in our country a bit more than 120 new uh, patients per year. So as the time is passing by, I increasingly start by the, the end actually. And I used to uh, present this uh, slide at the end of my talk for, for years, but uh, from year to year, uh, I now uh, present it uh, at the beginning because I do believe that nowadays 
this slide represents one of the most uh, crucial aspects in the uh, field of TTP. This is the uh, diagnostic issues in TTP. The point is that you may not miss the diagnosis of the disease that must be done rapidly because a rapid diagnosis with an adapted treatment nowadays leads to more than 95% of survival, as we will see later. On the opposite, a diagnosis which is missed uh, or a patient that is uh, uh, inadequately managed uh, may uh, experience death in almost all cases. And keep in mind that most, if not all, the current deaths in TTP at this time result from a diagnostic delay, whereas uh, instead death has become exceptional once treatment is started. So this is a crucial point because uh, it's very important to make clinicians more aware of TTP diagnosis with simple algorithms, simple because not everybody can know uh, everybody, and this is a, a rare disease. So we need simple algorithms so, so that uh, any practitioner uh, in the emergency room uh, leads to an uh, easy uh, diagnosis in uh, any kind of context. So this approach is a major goal for uh, more generally rare and spontaneously fatal diseases, but that may be of good prognosis under treatment. And this is an issue which is nicely illustrated by TTP. So this is the summary of the clinical presentation of uh, TTP. You can see that uh, this is I focused here on the autoimmune form which you may uh, uh, cross more, more frequently. Typically, uh, patients are around 40 years old. Uh, the disease mostly involves women, as you can see. Uh, three quarters of patients are women. Patients may have fever or not. And importantly, you can see that uh, cerebral involvement is variable and far from constant. You can see that more than 20 years ago, 90% of patients had a cerebral involvement, whereas 20 years later, 10 years later, this frequency fell to 50% only. And this is simply because we learned to uh, make the, the diagnosis of TTP earlier than we did uh, before. And now we increasingly make the diagnosis of TTP at the hematologic step of the disease and we do not wait anymore for uh, any kind of organ failure. And this is the, the good way to go. Biologically, patients have typically severe cytopenias. Uh, you can see that hemoglobin level is around seven or eight uh, grams. Uh, LDH level that reflects not only hemolysis, but most of all organ involvement and organ injury uh, is uh, uh, increased. Platelet count is uh, profoundly uh, uh, decreased, uh, typically below 30,000. And on the opposite, creatinine level is uh, frequently normal or typically midly increased. <coughs> and these are crucial uh, 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 aspects of the uh, clinical picture of the disease because uh, everybody knows that the the best way to ascertain the diagnosis of TTP is to measure adamsutin activity and to show that these patients have an undetectable adamsutin activity. Nevertheless, as you know, the adamsutin activity is not so easily uh, available in uh, uh, real time. And the turnaround time to have the result of adamsutin activity is typically between two to five days uh, at the best. And this is a, an issue which is a general in the world, even with the uh, uh, best trained uh, teams, uh, because uh, simply you know that these patients typically uh, have to be managed uh, on Friday evening or in the weekend or during the night. Uh, so at these times, uh, uh, it's not so easy to have uh, an Adam Sutin activity to start the treatment. So it is crucial to have an uh, 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 the clinical uh, uh, feeling of the diagnosis 
and to uh, anticipate adamcetin activity from a basic uh, clinical presentation. And this is why uh, many teams attempted to uh, derive clinical scores from a standard uh, clinical presentation to anticipate and predict adamcetin deficiency. So you have uh, so far uh, two uh, uh, clinical scores that are uh, available and that were uh, prospectively uh, validated. <laughs> it's first the French score uh, set up in 2010 and more recently the uh, plastic score. Both scores tell the same story and they say that in a patient with features of thrombotic microangiopathy and no associated uh, condition, uh, which may be a uh, context of uh, transplantation, cancer, but also chemotherapy, pregnancy, and severe sepsis, in those patients with no uh, any kind of, this, of uh, such a presentation, Patients with a severe thrombocytopenia below 30,000 and mild renal involvement, defined by a creatinine level below 2.26, uh, those patients have virtually, uh, have uh, quite systematically, a severe uh, adamcetin deficiency. And this, uh, this score, and typically the French score, has been used uh, in uh, some international clinical trials. I will uh, present you the Titan and uh, Hercules uh, trial on which uh, clinicians did not have to wait for adamcetin activity. And now uh, on the Mayari uh, trial, I will uh, talk about uh, the French score is also uh, used to predict adamcetin deficiency and start treatment before having adamcetin activity results. So this is a crucial aspect because once again, you must not wait for adamcetin activity to start in emergency the treatment because simply those patients are at risk of sudden death at uh, any time. So this is the pathophysiological basis of TTP treatment. This is what you need to have in mind to understand the treatment in this disease. So, uh, as discussed, patients with uh, TTP have a severe adamcetin deficiency that results from B allelic mutations of the encoding gene or because of antibodies that block the activity of the enzyme. And consequently, uh, the substrate of adamcetin, the VWF multimers, accumulate upstream as a very high molecular weight multimers. And these uh, 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 multimers are highly adhesive towards platelets and they uh, induce uh, uh, hyper adhesiveness and lead to uh, the formation of microtrombi in the microvasculature. Because in the microvasculature, you have a high shear stress that uh, makes uh, VWF uh, uh, like a string and exposes the uh, binding sites to platelets. So this is why this is a disease that involves microvasculature. So uh, without adamstatin, high molecular weight VWF induces platelet aggregation and systemic uh, microtrombi and uh, the death of the patient in the absence of treatment. So based on that, you understand that patients need to uh, uh, receive high levels of uh, exogenous adamstatin to saturate the antibodies against the enzyme and then to cleave the large VWF multimers. So this can be uh, achieved by uh, bringing patients a very large volume of plasma through uh, plasma exchange. So here is an interesting uh, debate about whether the plasma ferrosis by itself is important or not in the management of these patients. For years, it has been uh, claimed that uh, the plasma pheresis may remove the uh, antibodies against adam but also some various cytokines, the uh, VWF multimers, and other compounds uh, that uh, maintain uh, platelet uh, hyperadhesiveness. But basically, uh, we have to say that no work uh, uh, clearly shown this uh, aspect. And this is crucial because I will, as I will talk about later, now we um, 
uh, uh, are thinking about uh, uh, PEX-free treatments uh, on which we may uh, get rid of plasmapheresis. Second approach, these patients have antibodies against adamstatin. So here you need to target more or less selectivity, selectively the uh, immune system with typically rituximab to target B cells, uh, cyclosporine A to uh, target instead T cells. More recently, there were uh, attempts to target plasma cells. And uh, you also have the more historical immunosuppressors such as uh, uh, corticosteroids, cyclophosphamide, and even uh, splenectomy uh, to a certain point. And the last uh, approach uh, attempts to inhibit the pathologic interaction between VWF and platelets. And this could be achieved by developing an antibody that recognizes the A1 domain of VWF preventing its interaction be, be to, uh, with the uh, GP1B on platelets. And this is uh, caplacizumab, as I will talk about. So this is the now historical treatment of autoimmune uh, TTP that uh, consisted in daily plasma exchange with steroids in emergency until remission. So this has been the, the core treatment of TTP for years. And uh, as you know, with this uh, regimen, the prognosis of the disease was outstandingly improved as uh, remission and survival rates could reach more than 85% versus before the systematic use of this regimen, almost all patients uh, died from the disease. So in the second step, as we learned that these patients had antibodies against adam we uh, attempted to add to this core regimen rituximab, first as a salvage therapy in those patients who had a refractory disease or who had exacerbations of the disease despite the lipospec exchange. And we observed uh, very encouraging uh, results because uh, as you can see, with the use of rituximab, we could uh, uh, prevent uh, slow responses to uh, plasma exchange. And clearly, rituximab could uh, limit the duration of a plasma exchange treatment. So it became very rare to uh, treat patients with daily plasma exchange uh, more than two weeks uh, uh, from the era of uh, rituximab. Whereas before this area, it was quite usual to treat patients more than two weeks with the plasma exchange. However, as you know, and this is an important point, rituximab is not efficient immediately. So keep this in mind. And you can see in the right part of the slide that in this refractory patient, we started with a plasma exchange, of course, and then rapidly with a rituximab. But nevertheless, even after the first infusion of rituximab, we had to wait for almost uh, uh, three weeks before the patient improves platelet count, uh, definitely. And on average, uh, it takes around two weeks between the first infusion of rituximab and platelet count recovery. So during this two weeks window of time, and despite rituximab, patients may be exposed to unfavorable outcomes, including death, refractoriness and exacerbations. So there was a need to have a, an additional compound to protect patients here until rituximab efficacy. So this is also an important slide because it shows you why patients should be treated systematically with rituximab frontline. Not only rituximab reduces the time to platelet count recovery, but most of all, as you can see, rituximab remarkably protects patients from clinical relapses for 12 to 18 months. This is a seminal work from the UK group who showed that in patients treated frontline with PEX, steroids, and rituximab, you can see no relapse during this period of time. Whereas on the opposite, on the historical group of patients, uh, this is the uh, dotted curve, you can see that soon after clinical recovery, patients rapidly relapse in many times. And this is because actually, despite the clinical recovery in these patients, these patients maintain 
a severe adamsocin deficiency in up to 40% of cases. Okay. And uh, we had shown that in 40 other percent of patients, adamsocin activity remains decreased, although detectable. But this means that these patients still have antibodies against the enzyme. So in total, 80% of patients maintain a decreased or undetectable adamsocin activity with antibodies against the enzyme, which exposes these patients to uh, early clinical relapses. So this is why the systematic use of rituximab frontline uh, improves more uh, durably uh, uh, adamsocin activity that remains stable throughout time. Thereafter, patients need to have a tight follow-up for years because after these 12 to 18 months uh, uh, period of time, uh, uh, the effect of uh, rituximab uh, vanishes and patients may drop again their enzyme activity and relapse clinically. So this is what we uh, showed here. You can see uh, again in this uh, uh, in the bottom curve that historical patients left with a persistent severe adamsotin deficiency relapse clinically uh, within a variable duration of time. It's simply a question of time, as you can see. Uh, and uh, overall, after an, a median of a seven year follow up, 74% of patients relapsed from the disease. Uh, 11 of uh, uh, the uh, 17 relapsers relapsed many times and two patients died from the disease, okay? On the opposite, you can see that the systematic retreatment with only rituximab in patients with only uh, a drop in adamsotin activity shifts the curve to the top and uh, uh, induces uh, much less uh, clinical relapses. Now, at this time, we uh, still uh, optimized our uh, management. And I have to say that the, the, our results are uh, still better than the top curve. And uh, now uh, the, the, the clinical relapses uh, in our patients with TTP are extremely rare, which uh, led to a, a great change in the epidemiology of the disease in our country. So this strategy to uh, uh, offer these patients a regular follow-up on the basis of adamsotin activity and to treat these patients preemptively with rituximab uh, as soon as adamsotin activity drops is a, a, a consensual attitude which is supported by the uh, ISTH guidelines published two years ago. Next step in the management of TTP is the development of caplacizumab. Caplacizumab is an antibody, or more exactly a nanobody, which is uh, derived from uh, antibodies of uh, camelidae, which are characterized by uh, producing uh, normal antibodies, but also smaller antibodies that are more easy to uh, uh, work on. And uh, caplacizumab is basically uh, two heavy chain variable domains that are targeted uh, against the A1 domain of VWF. And those two uh, domains are linked by an uh, alanine uh, bound. And this is caplacizumab. So by binding the A1 domain of VWF, caplacizumab prevents the pathologic interaction between VWF and the uh, GP1B receptor on platelets and avoids the formation of further thrombi. So caplacizumab has been uh, evalu evaluated on two uh, international clinical uh, trials, Titan first and Hercules uh, in a second step. And you have here the flowchart of the Hercules trial that randomized 145 patients between the standard treatment with placebo versus standard treatment and caplacizumab. And the primary endpoint of both studies was the time to first platelet count recovery. And here is shown the integrated analysis of Titan and Hercules. And you can see that uh, uh, in the uh, caplacizumab arms, patients recovered platelet count faster than patients in the placebo arm. 
the difference was uh, significant, but uh, I have to say that the most striking difference between the two arms was not actually this primary endpoint. It was actually the fact that with Kaplasizumab, patients normalize rapidly Adam's, uh, platelet count, and platelet count is stabilized and does not drop anymore further on, okay? Whereas on the opposite, in the placebo arms, patients normalize platelet count some hours later, but platelet count remains unstable and uh, more than one third of patients dropped platelet count thereafter. And this is the, the, the crucial uh, uh, aspect uh, with caplacizumab. Not only it uh, improves more rapidly uh, platelet count recovery, but it stabilizes uh, platelet count. So it means that once platelet count recovers, it doesn't drop anymore uh, uh, thereafter. And this is important because, as you can see, this difference in the time to platelet count, uh, to durable platelet count recovery, uh, allows here to actually protect patients from unfavorable outcomes until, if you remember, rituximab is efficient in the control of the underlying autoimmune process, okay? So definitely you have to see caplacizumab as a, a bridge until rituximab uh, controls the uh, autoimmune process. This is how uh, caplacizumab works. And these are the secondary endpoints of the studies that are the derived from uh, the, this uh, primary endpoint. As uh, platelet count uh, improves more rapidly and durably, uh, patients with caplacizumab experience less death, less refractoriness, as you can see, and most impressively, much less uh, exacerbations. You can see uh, that the uh, uh, percentage of exacerbation drops from uh, six to uh, tenfold, uh, as I will show you. So on the basis of these uh, results, Kepesizumab uh, was uh, labeled for the use, uh, for, uh, uh, for the treatment of autoimmune TTP on the basis of a clinical diagnosis uh, in patients with uh, autoimmune TTP. So uh, in France, we could uh, benefit uh, from an early access program uh, at the end of uh, 2018. <coughs> so we set up a national uh, recommendation and national uh, regimen to uh, treat those patients uh, uh, homogeneously uh, throughout uh, France. And uh, we decided altogether to uh, treat these patients according to the uh, general uh, um, uh, schedule of uh, Hercules uh, trial. So as soon as patients uh, had a clinical diagnosis of TTP on the basis of the French score, uh, these patients were treated with a daily plasma exchange, immunosuppression with steroids and rituximab, and caplacizumab as well. So through an 18-month period, we treated 90 patients according to this uh, regimen, and uh, we compare them uh, to uh, historical patients. And you can see here in detail how we did. So patients with features of TMA were uh, uh, considered as, as having a TTP if they had a CV thrombocytopenia and mild renal involvement. The treatment was started and continued if some days later, uh, severe adaptogen deficiency was confirmed. And when platelet count uh, recovered, we stopped daily plasma exchange. We completed the course of rituximab and caplacizumab was continued until, let's say, for uh, easy purposes, until uh, Adam Sutin activity reached a protective level of 20%. And these are the results of uh, this uh, study. So you can see that as in the Hercules trial, patients in the triplet regimen, so this means that they received caplacizumab, experience much less 
unfavorable outcomes. You can see that deaths and refractoriness are extremely rare now, around 1% versus almost 7% and 18% respectively. And more impressive, impressively in a quantitative aspect, you can see that, uh, as I told you, we decreased by tenfold the frequency of exacerbations, okay? And as a result, we could decrease by twofold the burden of care in these patients which means that we uh, performed twice less uh, plasma exchange, we used twice less uh, volumes of plasma, and the uh, duration of hospitalization was also decreased by twofold. So clearly, we observed uh, an improvement in the management of these patients that confirmed in a real life uh, 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 context the data of the international trials. And this is the a cartoon uh, for which we are uh, found, I would say, uh, almost uh, every week. Because once platelet count recovers and uh, that uh, uh, daily plasma exchange has stopped, uh, clinicians want to know when they can stop caplacizumab, of course. Because as you know, there are some uh, concerns about the, the price of this uh, compound. And the, the answer is uh, uh, basically uh, in this slide. Uh, uh, the caplacizumab has to be stopped once patients are uh, protected from uh, clinical relapses. So this means that adamcetin activity must reach a protective level of, let's say, 20%. It is an uh, empirical uh, threshold which, which is based on the experience of various teams in the field of uh, preemptive treatment. And we all observed that we never have TTP in patients with more than 20% of adam activity. So there's some debate about 10 or 20% of adam activity, but let's use 20% uh, for uh, 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 more uh, simplicity uh, purposes. And you can see here that uh, once uh, pegs are stopped, well, 50% of patients will reach 20% of adamcetin activity within 28 days. Okay, so this means that 50% of patients will need more than 28 days of treatment with caplacizumab. And you can see that 10% of patients will require more than two months of treatment with caplacizumab, okay, which raises again some concerns about uh, side effects and uh, about uh, the cost of the of the compound. So at this time, uh, we need uh, further studies to better and more rapidly identify those patients who will be slow responders to immunosuppression and who will be exposed to uh, more treatment with caplacizumab to intensify in these patients the immunosuppression treatment to shorten the duration of severe adenosine deficiency. So the, the treatment with uh, caplacizumab is so uh, efficient now that the next question is to uh, know whether uh, plasma exchange are uh, still useful. And some groups started to uh, treat patients without plasma exchange. So I clearly say here that this is not the standard of care, and this is not my recommendation at this point, because this very attractive strategy, of course, must be uh, evaluated through uh, clinical trials. Okay. So for me, in my opinion, is not uh, so uh, wise to uh, uh, get rid of plasma exchange at this step outside a clinical trial, okay? But nevertheless, the, the story of treating patients without PECS started in uh, Jehovah Witnesses who cannot be treated with uh, plasma, as you know, and who usually died from this disease. And uh, two American teams treated these patients with, who were dying from the disease with caplacizumab, and they could observe that uh, miraculously, these patients recovered from the disease. So clearly this gave a, a green light for this uh, strategy. And you can see here 
on this paper that uh, the Austrian group and the uh, German group treated six patients that presented seven episodes with caplacizumab, uh, uh, typically uh, immunosuppression, but with no plasma exchange and no plasma infusion. I just put you here the uh, patient's presentation on diagnosis to show you that these patients had usually a severe presentation. They did not treat the most easiest patients, but some patients were really uh, 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 severe patients. You can see uh, particularly this uh, patient who was a 75-year-old. She had a cerebral and cardiac involvement. She had a very high LDH level uh, uh, reflecting uh, severe organ involvement. And nevertheless, all of these patients treated with only caplacizumab nicely improved their platelet count, as you can see uh, here uh, through the uh, blue uh, curves. Uh, LDH level in green uh, decreased in all patients, and uh, adamantine activity in red more or less uh, increased in uh, all patients or uh, almost. So this uh, experience goes in the good way to uh, 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 explore this uh, uh, strategy. And now uh, two, uh, I would say even three clinical trials uh, started or will soon start to assess whether <clears throat> one could treat these patients without PECs. So the first trial is the trial of uh, Sanofi that uh, test uh, tr uh, treatment with immunosuppression, carplacizumab, and no plasma exchange. A French academic trial that would test uh, immunosuppression, carplacizumab, and plasma infusion without plasma pharesis. And um, Takeda uh, wishes to uh, uh, evaluate the, the uh, treatment with a recombinant adamstatin protein, immunosuppression, and nothing else. So all these uh, uh, strategies are uh, ongoing. And in the next uh, few years, as you can see, the historical treatment of TTP will have to, will need to be uh, rewritten. And lastly, for the treatment, uh, you can, uh, this is uh, 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 the results of a phase one trial that reported the efficacy and most of all the tolerance of the recombinant uh, form of uh, adamstatin, which is developed by uh, Takeda. So in this phase one uh, trial, uh, 15 patients who received a single infusion of uh, recombinant adamstatin uh, presented no side effects and especially no patient uh, developed uh, antibodies and immunization against the recombinant protein. The half-life of the enzyme uh, was comparable to uh, this of the uh, of the wild-type uh, protein. And for those patients who had a mild thrombocytopenia and increased LDH level, the single infusion of recombinant adamstatin allowed to normalize these uh, parameters. So here again, all the uh, lights were green to uh, set up uh, trials to test uh, the recombinant adamstatin in the congenital form of the disease first, and then in the autoimmune form of the disease. So now, uh, with all of these uh, highly efficient uh, therapies, uh, you will ask me why patients still die from TTP. And this is the uh, real question. And to illustrate this uh, uh, concern, I will present you uh, rapidly two uh, cases. This first case is a, the case of a 45-year-old patient who presented in 2007 in the evening uh, a clinical picture of uh, abdominal pain <coughs> and uh, nausea. She thought that uh, this is because she had uh, eaten uh, muscles uh, the day before. Then she vomited, she had uh, hematemesis. Her husband found uh, she was a little bit uh, yellow, so she consulted her GP who uh, requested an uh, abdominal ultrasound sonography that was normal, and the blood cell count that disclosed a severe thrombocytopenia with uh, anemia. So given this uh, clinical picture, the diagnosis in the emergency room uh, that was made was uh, an autoimmune thrombocytopenia. 
and the patient was uh, treated uh, accordingly with uh, corticosteroids. Uh, she was, the patient was told that uh, ITP was a benign uh, disorder, which outcome was almost systematically uh, favorable. And uh, that's it. And uh, in the night, the biologists uh, phoned the clinicians to uh, tell them, be careful, we see schistocytes on blood smear. Uh, this was confirmed. Uh, so uh, be careful about uh, a TTP. And the answer of the clinicians was, there is no organ involvement. Uh, 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 neurological uh, examination is normal, so we keep ITP as the good diagnosis. Unfortunately, uh, some hours uh, later, uh, the patient presented a sudden death by cardiorespiratory uh, arrest. And, uh, and uh, of course, this was a, a drama. Uh, and uh, there was an autopsy as the death was, uh, was completely unexpected. And the diagnosis of TTP was made post-mortem. And we could find an aliquote of a serum that uh, had been sampled uh, at the admission of the patient that uh, in the end found a severe adaptive deficiency with uh, antibodies against the enzyme. So unfortunately, this patient had too late, of course, uh, the diagnosis of TTP. So this was in 2007. You will tell me that we learned a lot uh, since then. But uh, look at this uh, story uh, last year. A 44-year-old patient who was hospitalized uh, for hemorrhage with B cytopenia. She had a history of thyroiditis, and in the sister, uh, there was a history of uh, thyroiditis as well and vitamin uh, B12 uh, deficiency. So everything was fine for her uh, the year before. And she started her story with a picture of a urinary infection. And in the emergency room on July 11, she had anemia with features of hemolysis. She had a severe thrombocytopenia. Uh, schistocytes were rare, but clearly uh, present at many times. Uh, the Coombs test was negative and renal function was normal, as was the neurological examination. Here again, the diagnosis was uh, autoimmune, uh, autoimmune thrombocytopenia. The patient was treated accordingly with corticosteroids and antibiotics uh, and uh, a, a, a supply with uh, vitamin B12. Uh, two days uh, later, she's transferred to a medical department where a bone marrow aspiration uh, is made and is consistent with a peripheral thrombocytopenia. And in this department, the hypotheses for the diagnosis are a pernicious anemia because of the familial context. Second, a TMA, TTP or HUS, but as it is written in the patient's file, no renal failure, no CNS involvement, so the diagnosis is not retained. Autoimmune thrombocytopenia, Autoimmune cytopenia with a lymphoproliferative disease because the uh, thrombocytopenia does not respond so well to steroids. And lastly, an acute leukemia. Steroids are pursued as a uh, vitamin B12 uh, treatment. And on July uh, 16, uh, at 6 a.m., the patient is uh, nice and well, according to the, to the nurse. But uh, some hours later, uh, at the doctor's uh, visit, the patient is found uh, unconscious, agitated with midriasis. Uh, arterial pressure is very low. She's uh, then uh, transfused in emergency and transferred to the uh, ICU, where the diagnosis of TTP is rapidly made. So uh, now the patient has uh, clinical signs of TTP, but it's too late. She's intubated. The cerebral TDM uh, finds uh, actually no hemorrhage and uh, was uh, basically normal. And at 11.40, uh, she has a bradycardia, an electromechanic dissociation, and dies. And some days later, again, Adam's certain activity will come back undetectable. 
So you can see that uh, if I am pessimistic, uh, I can say that uh, we did not learn so much from 2007 to uh, last year. But uh, well, this is to uh, illustrate you that uh, one of the most important aspects in the management of TTP so far, now that uh, treatments are so efficient, is not to miss the diagnosis of TTP. And this remains one of the most important issues in the field. Okay, so I will go a bit uh, faster to keep the time. This is the, 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 the heart of the problem because many of us learned that to have a, uh, to, to, to keep, to make the diagnosis of TTP, there was a need to have a pentade that had to include cerebral involvement, renal involvement, fever, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia. But this approach is uh, completely unappropriated uh, at a time we have highly efficient treatments. This approach uh, has a very low uh, sensitivity, although it has a high specificity. But here, we do not need specificity. We need sensitivity. So with this approach, we make the diagnosis lately and sometimes pre-mortem. So this is clearly to put at the, uh, uh, at the bin of the story. And more, uh, um, this is the more uh, adapted uh, uh, strategy uh, for the diagnosis of TTP. In a patient with thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia or only hemolysis, if you have schistocytes that you have to search in this context, keep the diagnosis of TTP. And in patients with cytopenias and unexplained organ failure, even if schistocytes are formally negative, think about the diagnosis of TTP. And once you made the diagnosis of TTP, congrats, you made the most uh, uh, challenging uh, uh, point of the uh, strategy, refer the patient to, uh, or at least contact a trained team for treatment uh, immediately. So now I will, uh, again present you the case of this uh, uh, girl of 46 uh, years old. She had a severe thrombocytopenia, 7K, uh, mild renal involvement, 1.7 milligram per deciliter of serum uh, creatinine, uh, features of uh, hemolysis. So uh, uh, Adam Sutin activity is pending. So here were the uh, uh, questions. The French score of this patient is consistent with uh, TTP. The French score of this patient is consistent with HOS. The patient should be treated with daily plasma exchange and steroids, or instead with PEX, immunosuppression, and caplacizumab from day one. And caplacizumab should be started after Adam Sutin activity confirms TTP diagnosis. So do you want to vote again? So we wait another 10 seconds. Okay, so um, definitely it's changed quite drastically from the beginning, which shows how um, useful this, um, this talk for um, everyone. So um, what we have now is that um, the vast majority of participants, 61%, um, answered that um, daily packs plus corticosteroids, rituximab plus caplicizumab from day one would be um, their choice of approach. 27% um, uh, remained with the French score of this patient is consistent with a TTP. Um, and 12% um, caplacizumab started after ADAMTS-13 activity confirms TTP. Um, while nobody um, chose the French score of this patient is consistent with an atypical HUS, with a HUS, sorry, and no patients 
no um, participants chose patients should receive daily packs plus corticosteroids from day one. So again, 61% chose the full range of treatment plus caplicizumab from day one. Okay, I reached my goal, so <laughs> great, <clears throat> indeed. So here, uh, the, these patients typically had features consistent with a TTP because uh, she had a severe thrombocytopenia below uh, 30,000 and renal involvement was uh, uh, below the uh, typical threshold of uh, 2.26, uh, which is again consistent with a TTP. So in a patient with features of TMA, no context, uh, no, no underlying context and uh, uh, CV thrombocytopenia and mild renal involvement, 90 to 95 percent of these patients have a severe adamcetin deficiency. So, given the 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 the, the severity, the potential severity and the potential risk of death at any time of a TTP, it's mandatory uh, here to protect the patient with uh, caplacizumab and uh, plasma exchange to prevent those uh, 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 sudden deaths that we may observe in the simply the first hours or days of the of the management keep in mind that most deaths in these patients occur in the first hours or days of the management so it's not the the, the good practice to wait for uh, an unfavorable outcome to start caplacizumab. Caplacizumab prevents the uh, occurrence of unfavorable outcomes and is not here to treat the unfavorable outcomes once they are there. And again, this uh, strategy is uh, supported by the ISTH guidelines that were uh, published uh, two years ago. So uh, that's it. Uh, and uh, yes, a, a, another important point again is that uh, one should not wait for adamcetin activity to treat those patients with uh, the whole uh, uh, treatment. One may discuss uh, about a rituxima because you could see that uh, it does not work immediately. So one can wait for uh, three to four days to have adamcetin activity to be absolutely sure that the patient has TTP and then you start rituximab, but what will protect patients and organs from uh, TTP damage is uh, caplacizumab and plasma exchange and adamsutin supply. So please start caplacizumab and uh, plasma exchange as soon as you think about the diagnosis of TTP. So in conclusion, uh, you could see that with the current uh, highly active treatments, most patients uh, if not all, uh, survive from the acute phase of uh, TTP. However, keep in mind that death still occur as a result of a diagnostic uh, delay. So to make clinicians more aware about TTP diagnosis is a major goal to improve the prognosis of the disease. Targeted therapies based on anti-VWF agents, so here caplacizumab and soon the recombinant form of adamstatin that are efficient in real time immediately nicely prevent unfavorable outcomes in this disease. So now the next steps are indeed to first monitor adamcetin activity to personalize caplacizumab regimen and to stop it as soon as patients reach a protective threshold of adamcetin activity. And soon uh, the, 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 the very exciting approach of PEX-free regimens will be explored. With those new highly efficient therapeutic regimens, the only limiting, limiting factor to improve early prognosis in TTP is the time to diagnosis. So again, uh, uh, to fight against diagnosis delay is now the most crucial uh, issue in TTP. I thank you all for your attention. I'm open to question, and this to thank all my colleagues and friends who work in this field uh, in France, in the left part of the slide and uh, in the world in the right parts of the other side. Thanks a lot.
Well, thank you so much, Professor Kopp. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, we don't have much time for questions, but um, I think you gave a very clear and compelling presentation. I think we're all going to be more careful about identifying these patients correctly in the future because um, it is something that is a true medical emergency. While I wait to see if there are any questions from um, the audience, I wanted to briefly ask you, since I'm a pediatrician, if you can give us any insight um, more specifically on the management of the congenital forms, because I think that might be interesting to part of the audience. Sure, yes. The most recent uh, uh, works in the field of congenital uh, TTP uh, reveal that first, there's here again, a uh, very large uh, delay uh, in the diagnosis of the disease. And as a result, patients have the time to uh, uh, injure their organs chronically with this disease. So they uh, arrive at the, in adulthood with uh, typically, as you know, a chronic kidney disease, uh, heart failure, uh, multiple uh, infarctions in, in the brain with uh, severe consequences on uh, 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 cognitive function and uh, quality of life. So here again, we definitely have to fight against diagnostic delay and think about these diagnoses earlier in, uh, in life. Uh, second, we have now uh, very efficient treatments in these uh, patients as uh, recombinant adamstatin will be very soon available. So we now have an extension, uh, uh, um, an extension uh, protocol after the international trial that allows us to treat patients with recombinant adamstatin at home. So it's a, a wonderful uh, strategy for, for, for patients which are much more protected for their organs than uh, than in the past. So we, our hope is to to uh, uh, offer to these patients uh, uh, better protection of their organs and a better quality of life uh, lifelong. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I think we don't have much time for more, and um, I think that Stephanie at this point would like to um, introduce the, the next webinars. I'll take just a moment to thank you again so much for taking the time and for giving us this absolutely stellar overview. Thank you so much. Thanks to you. Bye-bye. See you soon. Yes, <clears throat> I would just like to uh, announce that after our winter break, we will have a webinar on uh, um, cystinuria on the 24th of January next year, and then uh, another um, webinar on dysplasia and the LUTO guideline, which was recently published on the 21st of February, um, presented um, by ERCNET members. And that's the next slide. Uh, we from ERCNET and uh, wish you all happy holidays and a relaxing break and hope to see you soon uh, in the next webinar rounds next year. Thank you. And thanks for joining Marina and Paul for the great presentation. Thank you, Merry Christmas and happy holidays to you all. Bye.